Professor Stephen Chan, welcome to BRI Dialogues. Uh, we're going to avoid going through your stellar track record and uh, resume and academic and, you know, diplomatic and all of that for the sake of time and in order to chip more at the iceberg of this uh, career and wisdom. So we're delighted to have you with us. And uh, Anush and I wanted to welcome you. So is Gia, our intern at Durham University. And um, we, we want to roll in, in a complex world and with everything that is happening. And maybe it would be good to open with a question with the United Nations General Assembly and your thoughts on the global state of affairs and what keeps you hopeful and what keeps you worried about this world we're living in. Well, just about everything keeps me worried. But in fact, I think there have been a number of diplomatic signals being made at the UN General Assembly right now. I mean, China's announcement, for instance, that it's going to curtail new developments of coal powered uh, energy. Uh, that's actually a major statement. Uh, this is projects outside China, so it leaves very much intact the question about what about uh, coal fired energy within China. But certainly it means a big change in terms of their foreign relations and their aid projects in many parts of the world, including Africa. And of course, what you've got are the efforts by President Biden to sound reassuring to the world and an end to relentless war and the beginnings of relentless diplomacy. Uh, there's only one problem with that, of course, and that is that so far underneath this administration, the diplomacy has curiously not been at the very highest level. So there may have to be one or two shakeups in the State Department to make relentless diplomacy work. But certainly it's a signal of rolling back the bellicose and aggressive rhetoric, at least, of the United States. And I think that President Xi's statement about coal, about the climate, uh, is also very, very much a signal of an attempt, at least, at pragmatism. And both leaders, and these are the two great superpowers, of course, now, are attempting basically to reassure the world. At the same time, I was actually very heartened by the fact that President Biden made a very short but very precise reference to the elections in Zambia in Africa, where I lived for many years, saying how heartened he was that the young people of that country had voted for democratic change. Uh, this went down very, very well in Zambia, usually ignored by American presidents. I don't think President Trump even knew where the place was. And so in a very subtle way, President Biden touched many, many bases in his presentation at the United Nations. And it's rather eclipsed, however, the statements of other world leaders. You've got a very angry President Macron right now, but no one's actually listening to him. And I wonder whether or not it was a mistake to deny the Taliban leadership some kind of at least tentative platform by which they might uh, at least attempt to communicate with the outside world. Uh, because the whole idea of isolating a difficult and in many, many ways still dangerous regime, uh, that may not be the way forward. Uh, so maybe there are all kinds of back channels and hidden diplomacy. Certainly the Chinese have been very, very active in back channel diplomacy with the Taliban leadership. Not sure the Americans have beyond a certain extent. Right now, it's the Turks, the Qataris, and the Chinese who are making all the play there. So nothing that is manifest on the surface in New York at the General Assembly. So despite the heartening statements from world leaders, there's a lot of, as it were, subterranean agenda that we need to know about before we can be truly hopeful for the future. Steve, that is really interesting, the way that you have you have uh, unpacked what's going on um, in, in New York. Of course, as you said, much depends on Beijing and Washington's perceptions of the world, but also of each other. So how do you think uh, President Biden's speech would have been received uh, in Beijing? I think it would have been well received in the sense they would have been relieved. He didn't come in with a full frontal attack on uh, China. I think the telephone call a few days ago between the two presidents was very much deliberately designed as basically a reassurance type of conversation, a confidence building measure. 
And the fact that it took place just a few days before the General Assembly meeting in New York, I think that was deliberately timed. So very, very obvious relentless diplomacy, perhaps. Uh, my concern is that the Americans need to get more subtle in their relentless diplomacy. Similarly, with the Chinese, I mean, uh, there's been a new, as it were, uh, resurgence of a certain kind of Chinese diplomacy that we haven't seen for a long time, what they call the Wolf Warrior Ambassador. I'm not sure that that has actually got good mileage in it. I think that could alienate far more people than the interests of China that it might serve. And so I think the Chinese also need to unpack their diplomacy and have a blend of both Wolf Warrior and much more friendly uh, warriorhood, as it were. Uh, but I do take this as a deliberate signal by President Xi about the coal-fired energy projects uh, that he may well wish to roll back the wolves a little bit at least. So are you suggesting that, that uh, China is deliberately um, unpacking its priorities? So it's putting the climate crisis in one basket and it's putting, if you like, international security in the other basket? Because what you say certainly resonates with the rest of the world. But then on the other side of it, you've got OCOS, where the Americans are now the key actor in it. And I wonder, where does Beijing bring these two competing narratives, if you like, together? On the one hand, maximum diplomacy, for want of a better term, from Washington. On the other hand, uh, proliferation of more nuclear assets uh, in China's backyard. Basically, the Chinese are, of course, worried about any proliferation of nuclear deployment, particularly close to home. Uh, and so they will have a genuine concern about that. That was something, I think, for continued relentless diplomacy, but not necessarily of a public sort. And there could well be certain deals made on that front. Uh, will the Chinese, for instance, in exchange for some kind of winding down or rolling back of American and Western deployment, of these weapons give some kind of guarantee that they could do the same with North Korean development of nuclear weapons, for instance. In other words, rather than being alarmed by this, I'm basically seeing this as the putting forward in the first instance of a number of possible quid pro quos. In other words, this is a long game. It's going to be played out very, very gently but I think that both countries want to say, OK, look, uh, you can get a glimpse of what our negotiating position is likely to be. You give us something and we might be able to give you something. So tentative, the two leaders certainly need to get to know each other a lot better. And there's all kinds of unresolved issues, uh, such as electronic malware or whatever, the whole Huawei sort of uh, way of doing things. I mean, one of the signals that Biden and America could send to China is the sudden and mysterious diplomatically, as were camouflaged, a dropping of charges against the Huawei chief executive, who's underneath a form of rather luxurious, I might say, house arrest in Canada right now. Something simple like that to try to signal that maybe deals can be made. In other words, we're not going to have trumpets sounding at any time in the next five years or so about our oh, breakthrough world peace is here at last. There'll be a number of backroom deals, side deals that all the same, when you look at the results closely, might signal, at least in part, a slightly, as it were, safer world in which all of us can live. But I mean, your point about Biden, Xi, America, China, this leaves the Europeans for dead, and it certainly leaves the British for dead. We don't figure anymore. And curiously, the diplomacy of what you would have regarded as side players like Turkey uh, is starting to pay some kind of dividend, not as much as they would like, of course. But for me, the surprise emergence has just been the superb, uh, very subtle diplomacy of the Qataris. Uh, who would have thought that a tiny country like that uh, could basically punch above its diplomatic weight you know, so superbly. And I'm very heartened by that because the Taliban were in exile in Qatar for quite a number of years. And they would have been dealing with someone I know very, very well, the deputy foreign minister of Qatar, who's a woman, LSE trained, uh, very, very, as it were, 
aware of Western ways and customs, but all the same, totally accepted within her own society. That kind of example setting, no loud beating of drums, but just setting an example, that kind of quiet diplomacy, good offices diplomacy, Qataris have been more than impressive on that front. So I think that two great superpowers, but a number of quite surprising emerging, as it were, second echelon diplomatic powers might emerge from all of this. That's amazing the way you unpack it, Steve. Uh, we're talking about uh, back channel diplomacy, track two, track three, track four. Are we, are we going to see that climate change becoming track five or track four and a half? Because without collaboration between US and China, it's almost impossible to tackle or assume anything like net zero. And I wanna share a figure with all three of you and maybe Gia and the team at Durham have to challenge me, but I did a Google search on the shorelines of China, Steve. It's 14,500 kilometers. I did a Google search on US shorelines, West and East Coast. It came to 154,000 kilometers. I was shocked. And on both coasts, you have the tech hub in Silicon Valley and the financial hub in the you know, Eastern coast. Is there a, a, a menu a la carte type of thing on climate change between China and US? That US says, China, I want you to collaborate on net zero but on everything else, I'll still try to challenge you. What are your thoughts on that track four and a half diplomacy? <laughs> well, I don't think it's going to go down the scale quite as far as track four and a half. It's going to hover somewhere between track one and track two. Uh, what I, uh, to the chagrin of my conflict resolution colleagues, uh, describe as track one and a half. There's an awful lot of track one and a half diplomacy in the world uh, right now. I mean, a lot of my own involvements you would probably describe as track one and a half, you know, completely deniable by track one, uh, thank goodness. And at the same time, still with an international civil society perspective, very, very much in mind. And I think bringing in international civil society insofar as it's very much concerned about climate change, uh, that is going to be the way forward. Uh, the development of new protocols, building on existing protocols, but not just grand sweeping a climate change treaties, but the fine print, which might give way to sub treaties on specific forms of energy generation, on specific forms of a carbon offsetting, you know, all of those kinds of things. In other words, when we say that the devil's in the detail, that might be never so true as in the case of climate change. And that will take some skillful diplomacy. Now, in fact, curiously, the environmental lobby internationally is very, very well set up. They need the ginger groups like Extinction Rebellion. Half my students, I'm sure yours too, <laughs> seem to belong to Extinction Rebellion, and I give them full permission to skip lectures to go off and <laughs> attend the big demonstrations. And I'm quite prepared to come down and bail them out of police cells if necessary afterwards. But there's a feeding chain here. Uh, you need to have the crazies, the radicals, and, you know, all of us were crazy and young radicals and street fighting men and women at one point in time. So the new generation is picking up that pattern. But there's a feeding change from the young crazies to civil society in an organized, decorous, but all the same forceful way, through to efforts to establish a formal track one apparatus. Now, John Kerry in the United States has not gotten his show off the ground as yet. And that surprises me because I think he was an extremely good Secretary of State. You know, you couldn't have had anyone better given the circumstances of that particular day. And so what I'm thinking is that no one's actually giving him the support that he needs to get his show as environmental secretary up and running, which basically points the finger, I think, to Biden himself, you know, why is this not being prioritized more aggressively in the Biden administration? There's someone with the skills and the gravitas of John Kerry just being used as a cosmetic symbol. So there has to be a very, very close look at this formal side of things at the very highest track one level. And I'm not really sure to whom Kerry is reaching out in international environment or civil society. In other words, I don't get any signal he's trying to cultivate at this stage, attract one and a half. But I think he's going to have to do this to make it work. 
Uh, I think there again, over the next year, we're going to see some very interesting close quarter diplomacy that will be hard to detect at first, but which could make a considerable difference in terms of these small scale specific issue, environmental sub treaties as I describe them in the future. So actually following on from what Ali just asked you, Steve, so would you, do you hold much hope for success in Glasgow following COP26, or do you see that as much more of a cosmetic uh, window dressing to the problems that we face? That's going to be largely cosmetic. Um, the Chinese have already fired that big gun uh, that they've got right now. That doesn't actually cost them very much. It's just winding down a few overseas coal-fired sort of energy projects. That's very much a big gun that's essentially a big signal more than anything truly substantive. The substantive work would have to take place, as I said, in China itself. Uh, but no one is going to be able to come uh, to Glasgow with a major announcement. In other words, you're not going to get a major announcement from the Americans of a, a sudden leap towards solar powered energy, for instance. You're not going to get a sudden leap saying that we're going to scale down for fossil fuels by a dramatic 30% in the next five years. You know, they're just not in a position to say that. What you're going to get out of Glasgow are going to be very, very fine words. You know, there are no end of wonderful speech writers. I mean, I think all of us have taken our turn <laughs> writing these bloody things. <laughs> uh, but you are going to get, I think, the beginnings of all kinds of diplomatic channels which can take things forward for the future. So nothing substantive in Glasgow, fine words, but hopefully the beginnings of some kind of methodologies by which these issues and their complexity can be addressed. Nothing complex in Glasgow. It's going to be fine general statements, fine general targets, which no one is ever going to be able to meet. Uh, the devil, as I said, is going to be in the detail, very, very important detail. We only have one ecology, we only have one environment. And you know, that's actually in actual grave danger. And I believe my students, uh, they present their data to me, the Extinction Rebellion data, a lot of it is a, a lot of element, of course, of over-egging on the data that they've got. But the core of it is that we are basically entering an environmental crisis. So I think that slowly this is dawning on even the most conservative world leader. You were talking about diplomatic efforts and diplomacy. A while back, I was on a call with David Miliband on a group Zoom call, and I used the word diplomacy as everything being in a state of mess. And so, so where does in this world of ever-changing Rubik cube, uh, fast or interchanging facades, as we're seeing with office as well, what is the significance of Belt Road Initiative, Steve, in this? ever-changing world? How would it fit into climate change, into, you know, development of infrastructure in Africa, in Middle East, in Levant, and in many of these war-torn economies along the way? Well, this is where the Chinese announcement uh, about uh, rolling back uh, coal-fired uh, energy production is very interesting because it's immediately going to throw into question a whole lot of projected developments along the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, both in terms of the literal Belt and Road going across Transcaucasia, and then in terms of the wider ramifications of Belt and Road. Let me just shut my window a bit. I've got a lawnmower outside. Uh, the wider Belt and Road uh, diplomatic and foreign aid initiative of the Chinese and many, many countries that is not joined up uh, like the physical Belt and Road across Transcaucasia. It means a reconfiguration of many of the energy projects contained in those initiatives. Uh, whether or not they're going to, in those new initiatives, suddenly substitute clean power, uh, you know, hydroelectric power, electric power that is generated from um, solar sources, for instance. And the only problem with that is that the state of technology so far as such that if you're going to build a giant solar powered energy generation station, it's going to cost more uh, than an old fashioned coal fire powered station because the technology to generate mega amounts of power economically, you know, after all, a poor country has got to operate this power station. 
and learning how to do that with complex technology to generate that amount of power. All of those are questions which need to be addressed. And of course, the environmental crisis is meant. There's no reliability in terms of hydroelectric generation. And a huge controversy around the Ethiopian dam that's going to dam up uh, you know, significant waters in the Nile River and the stress that this is causing the downstream neighbors. It shows that even with something that's meant to be clean, then you can't get much cleaner than hydroelectric power, has all kinds of problems for development. And of course, almost all of the big rivers that can generate a huge amount of energy flow through many different countries. And so there's always going to be a knock-on effect. How the Chinese would deal with that is again another question, because there's no doubt about it. Despite all of these questions, the Belt and Road Initiative and all of its many manifestations uh, is the big, big, it's the big scene in global development. No one else is putting this amount of effort, for good or for bad, but this amount of effort into development projects, this kind of magnitude, which will have this kind of difference making effect in so many different countries. Of course, the Chinese hope to gain advantage from it, and they play a very, very long game, game of very great patience, for instance. But the idea that there will be benefit for the recipients, that's very, very true. And so they're using this to build political goodwill, of course. They're also using it to build a security cordon for themselves. The reason why they were so swift off the mark in terms of opening avenues of dialogue with the Taliban was precisely because Afghanistan borders the most volatile province of Pakistan, the Luchistan. And the connection between the overland Belt and Road and the maritime Silk and Road means you've got to have at least three railway bridgeheads from southern China through Pakistan to the Pakistani coast. Uh, they discovered very, very late in the day that one of these railway lines uh, was immediately adjacent uh, to Afghanistan, running through Baluchistan, which has its own insurrection problems. It's a big, big problem uh, for the Pakistani government. Uh, and of course, if there's going to be cross-border traffic uh, of a militant sort, uh, this threatens to hold the hostage, this particular branch of the literal belt and road. So one of the things the Chinese are doing in their outreach to the Taliban is actually to protect their Belt and Road Initiative. And no one seems to have cottoned on to this uh, as yet, but that's basically a very great deal of Chinese self-interest at heart there, very pragmatic move. At the same time, and again, I don't think this is fully appreciated, the Taliban leadership is very much divided, of course, between those who are in exile and largely Qatar, and the inziles who stayed in fought. Uh, they've got much more radical views, those who stayed at port, those who were exposed to a more worldly environment in a place like Qatar, uh, were prepared to negotiate uh, more, uh, for instance. Uh, so the Chinese worked on them. But this is why you've got this confusion in Afghanistan right now. Women will still be allowed to go to university, although in segregated classes, okay? But women right now are not going to be allowed to go to school. And this is an exact representation of the cleavage in the Taliban leadership. The inziles won for now on the school front. The exiles won on the university front, but no one seems to know that the Chinese put a lot of pressure on the exile Taliban leadership. For goodness sake, let the women stay in university. And this is something which I think is a real social accomplishment on the part of the Chinese. Sure, they've got their own interests in mind, but this is going to be a huge relief to a vast segment of the Afghanistani female population. So let's hope that Pakistan, as it seems to be indicating at night, picks up the baton on the school front of female education in the schools. If Pakistan and China can do a joint act on this, that'd be great. And of course, all of this will benefit relationships between the two countries, China and Pakistan, benefit the Belt and Road, particularly the links between the overland and the maritime Belt and Road. We're seeing new reconfigurations of almost physical, tangible diplomacy and its tangible benefits in this part of the world. And again, 
the Americans don't seem to have cottoned on that this is happening. Uh, and they're going to pay for this because they're going to be wrong footed. They're going to wake up one day and just ask, how the hell did that happen? Well, it happened with an awful lot of patience, uh, an awful lot of risk taking and an awful lot of generosity, and also demanding a social good in return. And no one associates the Chinese with social good. But I think they really did put out on this particular issue about women in the university sector in Afghanistan. So the Belt and Road carries within all kinds of hidden implications which can be quite surprising. I've labeled this particular example, but there will be social benefits throughout all of the countries in which these developmental initiatives are fielded. So I actually see more positive merit in the Belt and Road uh, than alarm bells. The Americans, of course, are full of alarm bells. Some of them are justified. But by and large, I think there's great benefit to be gained from some of these projects. Steve, you, you've, you've masterfully covered a tremendous uh, range of issues, but with tremendous insight at the same time. I was going to ask uh, your, your thoughts on the post-pandemic world, and it relates very much to what you've, you've just articulated. Of course, you know, in the post-pandemic world, we seem to be obsessed with supply chains and value chains. And in that context, of course, the BRI becomes quite a unique uh, creature. Given what you've just said in terms of the way that, that, that China is strategizing about Eurasia and, and Transcaucasus and so on, so does the Belt and Road Initiative in that context becomes first more of a strategic feature of China's Eurasian strategy, for want of a better term? And I have a uh, subsidiary to that, and that is, so in many ways, China seems to be creating its whole new world of supply chains because Afghanistan's stability affects Pakistan, Iran, Tajikistan, India, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, the Persian Gulf countries, it has so much bigger aspect to it that you've only just began to touch on. But, but I would like to hear uh, your views further because you obviously have done a great deal of thinking about this. Well, in terms of supply chains, if I can just digress from Transcaucasia for a minute, but I'll come back to it uh, in terms of your question. What's actually been impressive in terms of the Chinese attempt to address the international pandemic has been its rollout of its Sinovac uh, vaccine. Um, there's been, a, believe it or not, the most successful vaccination program in Africa to date was in Zimbabwe, uh, but that was courtesy of a huge number of donations of Sinovac vaccines to Zimbabwe. Uh, so for better or for worse, and you've not exactly got the world's most progressive government in Zimbabwe right now, so some people would think, that, you know, this is a diplomacy that supports a malign regime. But the people of Zimbabwe are not going to be dying in droves like they have been in the neighboring country of Zambia, where I've lost friends, personal friends, uh, to COVID. The big test will be, and I think it's the French who are picking up the baton here, uh, can we actually get vaccine manufacture up and running in Africa itself? There's no reason why this can't happen particularly in a country like South Africa. In fact, a scandalous that the ANC leadership never realized they should be doing this in all of the years of majority rule. So there'll be a competition here to roll out benefits, but the Chinese have shown the way in this particular supply chain provision at a very, very difficult moment for many countries. Now, in terms of the international, as it were, supply chain, what you're gonna have, particularly in terms of Transcaucasia, you're going to have a bit of a competition which is going to require constant diplomatic negotiation over influence and spheres of influence in Transcaucasia. The Turks want in uh, because, of course, many of these countries are Turkic uh, speaking. Some of them were, in fact, part of the outreach of the old Ottoman Empire, uh, for instance. President Erdogan is basically a, a closet Ottoman 
a pasha. <laughs> uh, he makes no real bones about it. He has this imagination that, in fact, <laughs> there's a genuine historical relationship in terms of Turkic speaking uh, people, you know, Turkic related languages. The Chinese, of course, regard a lot of this as their own sphere of influence, for instance. Uh, and it's in their backyard, because, of course, you know, what you've got in uh, the Uyghur territories of Zhao, you know, uh, is very, very much people who speak a Turkic language and have an Islamic sort of religion uh, as part of that whole cultural affiliation. So cooperation between China and Turkey over issues that you might think are germane only to Transcaucasia are also issues that are going to be germane to the future internal security of China. Those two are going to have to come to some kind of deal about how to approach this. Similarly, and you can see this at work already, the good relationships, although they can be strained from time to time between Turkey and Iran, how are they going to divide up uh, Transcaucasia as you edge closer and closer to the Mediterranean? and the Gulf end uh, of things. And the literal Belt and Road is gonna pass through an awful lot of this. Everyone points to the old Silk Road as being the forerunner. In fact, the Mongol conquests were the real forerunners. They swept across this entire region, you know, reaching the gates of Vienna, you know, for instance. And that's what the West is worried about, not the kind of benefits the old Silk Road brought, but about the lack of benefit to Western civilizations that the Mongol invasions brought. There's going to be a local competition based largely on diplomatic efforts, nuanced perhaps, hopefully nuanced, between I think those three great powers, Turkey, Iran, and China, for influence over various bits and pieces of the Transcaucasian physical Belt and Road. But the Chinese will be putting the technology, let's hope with clean technology. But when you look at the Chinese model, you know, it's not just a Belt and a Road. Uh, we basically in the West scuppered their similar project. It was almost like a trial project in the southern part of Democratic Republic of Congo. They were going to build a Belt and Road, as it were, across the southern part of a vast African country. And what they were going to do, not only build the road, rail, telecommunications network, you know, you got, got everything all in one package, but they were going to build schools, hospitals and wait for this universities along the length of this Belt and Road. At one stroke, it would have joined up Southern Democratic Republic of Congo. At one stroke, it would have made that tumultuous country governable. At one stroke, it would have ended the warlord insurrections of Southern Southeastern Democratic Republic of Congo, where by our count of SOAS, and I'm sure your Africanists have been working on this, at least 3 million people of innocent civilian people have died as a result of the ongoing bloodshed. You know, it would have started to put an end to all of this. And we scuppered it in the West because we were fearful of Chinese political influence in the region. And of course, the Chinese recognize that you could be the poorest African parent on earth. You don't just want to send your kid to a primary school. You want them to bloody well go off to university. So the building of universities along the Democratic Republic of Congo prototype of the Belt and Road was a masterstroke of understanding local aspiration, which we in the West have still not gotten our heads around. If they do all of that, the Transcaucasian Belt and Road, you know, this is going to bring nothing but benefit, of course, at political cost to the West, because all this political goodwill will now go towards China. And of course, all kinds of trading links to the benefit of China will take place as a result of this. But you've got to have the imagination. You've got to take the huge risk. Now, whether the Chinese are going to go slow a little bit because of the international economic crisis is a very real question. That doesn't mean they're going to abandon their ambitions. Slowing it down doesn't even mean putting it on hold. It just means slowing it down. Within five years, we'll be up to full speed again, because I think that this is part of a long-term Chinese plan or economic benefit and, of course, political and diplomatic benefit to the Chinese posture, which they see emerging in the world over the next five or 10 years. 
Steve, I have a question for you, and um, I'm playing devil's advocate role here. Uh, the whole world is stuck on BRI, on uh, Sri Lanka deal and Port of Hambantota, yet you have disclosed so many elements in here. Is China suffering from inability, which I can't put my head around it, in better communicating its strategy along BRI, or is this an intention to keep it quiet, keep it low key? And would China, in light of all this criticism with everything you touched on at just right now in case of Congo, would it be conducive for its you know, integration and posturing in the world to annually uh, release a BRI scorecard based on its own optics of where they have done great where they have messed up and preempt this. Would that be an approach you think, or would you recommend anything like that? I would recommend it. I, with all my heart, I would recommend it. Uh, just getting data out of the Chinese in terms of uh, the stage three trial test results of, of their Sinovac vaccine. Um, you know, we haven't been able to do something as simple as that. Now, the vaccine clearly works because you know, the Chinese population has not dropped dead. Uh, the, <laughs> they have vaccinated a huge number of their own population, a huge number of Latin American and um, African populations. And it seems that there's an efficacy rate that is at least comparable uh, to that of the Western vaccines. Why not release the data uh, to demonstrate that laboratory measurements uh, support uh, what has been anecdotally noticed on the ground in many, many locations? The Chinese are just bloody awful with data transparency. They're just bloody awful with good public relations. It's like somebody in the Central Committee wants to give a didactic pronouncement of a doctrinaire sort on just about every single thing that moves uh, on earth. Almost like you're making uh, a Confucian eight-legged essay, which the pedantic scholars in the old days had to produce. You had to say something that not was meaningful, but which was able to fit in to the criteria of the eight-legged essay. And this held back Chinese scholarship for centuries. You know, why can't you have expressionistic scholarship? Why can't you have expressionistic public relations? And they're so bad at this that even great artists, great novelists who say the slightest word of dissidence, uh, you know, someone like Ai Weiwei, for instance, uh, is not exactly popular with the Chinese leadership. But the benefits of celebrating him in terms of public relations would be so much greater uh, than suffering any criticisms that he might make uh, from time to time. Uh, because everyone would say, look, you know, a great artistic figure has emerged from China, who's able also to behave like an artist and to speak freely. You know, what do the Chinese think artists are meant to do? They don't shut up. You know, artists are mad. You know, they're meant to be outspoken. <laughs> you know, that's historically what they do. You know, they make outrageous statements in art. They make outrageous statements in speech. Uh, they're creative. Uh, the Chinese just don't seem to get that. And the idea of trying to order things along doctrinaire lines, even their public relations, as long as they're committed to that, you're never going to get pu good public relations. You're never going to get the kind of subtlety and pitch and user-friendly approach to public relations. You know, the latest example, you know, of course, is TikTok. Now, if I were a Chinese public relations man, I'd be getting the message out of hundreds of creative TikTok performances every single day. You know, this is made in China. These are young people who are expressing themselves in China. Uh, oh, look, you know, there's a, a nice catchy phrase here, which uh, says something nice about President Xi, but not too much, just enough to inflect it. No, what's the response? They limit the amount of time a teenager can spend on TikTok. This is ridiculous. And uh, this is old men who don't understand the public relations needs and the messaging of the modern world. Uh, and as long as they do that, you know, the old generation can take all kinds of international understanding to the grave with them, because international understanding comes from at least the impersonation of openness. They could do at least a better job of pretending, but they don't seem to be able to do that. Here's a question for you on that front then, Steve. Uh, you know, the BRI 
is inevitably going to expose China and Chinese people to a multitude of other cultures, worldviews, uh, languages, traditions, and so on. Um, and given that they are the only game in town in many ways, that they have, in a sense, a, a monopoly of the, the BRI agenda, how, how is that interaction going to affect uh, China itself? That's one. The other is, we've talked a great deal about the, if you like, the Asian dimension of the BRI. Of course, we in Europe seem to think that we are going to be the end users of the BRI. Uh, you know, both parties, and, and these will lead to different strategies. So do you think it is foolhardy for the European Union and Britain to bank on, on BRI reaching European shores? Or do you think by the time it reaches Europe, it, it will have made so much quality difference in Asia that in many ways the European end will become superfluous? It will become superfluous. I mean, coming through Turkey um, is an entry point uh, to Europe. You know, that particular border between the old East and West is so permeable now. Uh, as for how the Chinese will react to the influx of new cultures, and I hope they do react positively, but uh, a huge number of African migrants to Guangzhou, for instance, are not exactly persuaded about cultural tolerance and cultural openness on the part of the Chinese in what is meant to be one of the more cosmopolitan southern Chinese cities. So there has to be a much greater awareness in China about what difference means. Now, if you can have a rigidly controlled society, difference coming from the outside is still going to be treated with the same method and rigid control as difference that emanates from the inside. It's a case of trying to accept difference. Now, I'm quite critical about uh, all of this. You can't accept the kind of difference in terms of the expression of young people in Hong Kong. You're not going to accept difference as expressed by somebody from Turkmenistan, for instance. You're not going to understand the need for people to express themselves in a way which is meaningful to them. Uh, if you're going to keep trying to have state control of registered religions, for instance, uh, where does this leave the multitudinous variants of even the mainstream religions? I mean, uh, the number of just subspecies of what we tend to think of in generic uh, terms of Sunni and Shia. Uh, I mean, I've been teaching my students about this, you know, how many variants there can be. Uh, or trying not to be declared apostate, but the, the amount of subtlety of belief. But a lot of these subtleties start intruding in a way that the state, as it were, religious organizers find difficult to understand. So all of these things need to be addressed. Now, I myself face these problems when I go to China. I haven't been for a little while uh, because I started to think it might be a little bit dangerous for me. I've been a bit critical, like I've been on your program, but always, I hope, in a constructive way. But Chinese people, I think I look Japanese. And when they are sure that I look Japanese, and I forgive them this, in Japan, they think I'm Japanese as well, then they talk behind my back about who is that bloody Japanese git who's just appeared at this conference or at this diplomatic gathering or whatever. And I've had a whole succession of interpreters, because I don't speak Mandarin, I only speak Cantonese, the southern language. So I had a whole string of um, interpreters coming up to me saying, Stephen, do you know what they're saying about you? And I said, actually, I, I don't, but I guarantee I can predict what it is that they're saying about me. So even someone who's Asian, East Asian, if that person comes across as a bit different, uh, is not going to get open arm uh, treatment. You've got to go through all kinds of tests to prove your bona fides. Now, a person who looks radically different, you know, Africans from the African continent with their own very, very significant and distinct habits. People from other parts of the world uh, with, let us say, the Aboriginal peoples of the South Pacific. Uh, how are they going to find uh, a China? Is it going to be able to understand uh, their cultures, where they come from? Uh, indigenous Indians from the Amazon. Is anyone in China going to regard them as anything more than exotica if they turn up at a Chinese 
environmental conference that is serious about accommodating and giving representation to people directly affected by environmental change. All these huge questions, which we think would have simple answers, these are going to be things that are going to be very, very challenging for the very conservative Chinese leadership and the very conservative social mindset that has developed as a result of this kind of continuous oversight throughout all of the years of the Chinese revolution. Steve, I think that what we have discussed today is so rich and so potent that we need definitely a second shot and a second dose. And we would love to have you back, but in spirit of time and bringing this into a closure, what would be your advice as somebody who knows that country better and far better than many of the observers, pundits and writers and authors, what would be your two biggest pieces of advice to Sinophobes and Sinophiles and in terms of bridging this gap? What would be your recommendation? Well, I have a very specific recommendation, and this is based on personal experience. A number of the institutions in China that claim to be academic and think tank related and things like that are nothing of the sort. You know, they're basically arms of the party and they're going to basically try to propagate a, a party line okay but what else well, that includes the ministry of foreign affairs that includes the chinese academy of social sciences uh, all the institutions that we as academics would normally deal with what i was very greatly surprised by was the think tank that's attached to the state council of the chinese prime minister uh, they're really good and this is because what you've got there in terms of their international section is a staffing not only of scholars, but former ambassadors. Uh, some of them are very highly educated, the former ambassadors. They've got PhDs and, and things like that. They've been around, they've understood cultures because they've been posted in what many Chinese would regard as exotic and strange places. And this combination means that in the State Council, at least they're provided with decent information. I would try to deal as much as possible with the think tank of the state council. I have nothing, based on my limited, but definitely personal experience, nothing but positive, uh, as it were, impressions of the way that they do things. Whereas I have very less than positive impressions of some of the other institutions. And as I say, we uh, as academics would normally deal with. You know, that kind of cosmopolitan, almost as it were cohabitation of scholarly and practical experiential knowledge can be brought together more often with good public relations, then the Chinese would be able to begin really to realize their international ambitions in a far more seamless and less chaotic way. It's something that they've got to do, they've got to look to themselves, they've got to stop being control freaks. A bit of expressionism, artistic, intellectual, among young people, even on TikTok, is not a bad thing. Now, once the old men get this through their thick heads and stop dyeing their white hair black, then maybe we're going to see some signs of realism and progress in China. I, I could see myself being put on the banned list immediately just by saying that about the old men dyeing their white hair black. So, <laughs> Uh, but yeah, that really is a message. Get with it, guys. You, you're unlikely to be banned from our conversations, Steve. So, so you, you, you shall you shall have a comfortable home here. Uh, you, you, you've, you've covered an extraordinary uh, amount of ground um, in such a short period of time with us, Steve. And you've been so responsive to our our probes and questions. Uh, that we can't thank you enough. We, we would like to talk with you about Africa uh, on another, uh, another occasion because you are unique in being able to reflect on China's footprint in Sub-Saharan Africa, but also equally on Africa's take on China's presence in Africa. That's the bit that you mentioned in passing, but we obviously don't pay enough attention to it. Um, and, and that continent is close to your heart as it should be to the rest of the world as well. So hopefully you will honor us by rejoining us uh, to talk much more concretely about what has China accomplished in Africa 
And we're very happy to African do that. African countries and African people think of China's presence uh, in Africa. That raises all sorts of questions about post-colonialism, about post-imperialism, about hegemony, all the issues that political scientists like to talk about. But you can bring all of that to a much more readily digestible set of issues that hopefully we can engage you with. I'm very happy to talk to you about exactly such issues. It would be a great pleasure. Thank you for joining us, Steve. We really, really enjoyed talking to you. No, you guys were good. I enjoyed the questions. So uh, let's do it again. Um, let's um, feel free to edit uh, my responses today in any which way that.